All right, hello everybody, Mr. Sweeter here. Uh, welcome to our lesson. Uh, this is Tools and Impressions uh, for Forensics. So please take a moment there to look at the objectives and standards. And our desired result, how are tools and impressions used in forensics? So tools is evidence. In daily occurrences, tools are used to make jobs or work easier. However, tools can also be used by criminals to commit a crime. Um, excuse me, some examples include hammers, screwdrivers, knives, crowbars, and saws. They are often used in break-ins of cars or buildings, uh, and in many cases, in many cases, excuse me, tools used in crimes can leave behind evidence called tool marks. So looking at tool marks, impressions, scratches, or abrasions made when contact occurs between a tool and an object is a tool mark. Evidence at a crime scene can include tool marks and help identify the suspect who used the tool. There can also be defects in tools if they are used over many times, or they may oxidize or rust, which make them unique. Serial numbers also come on tools which can help with evidence. Major categories of tool marks. Number one, indentation marks. These are made when a tool is pressed against a softer surface, which often creates a negative impression on the object receiving the force. Number two, abrasion marks occur when surfaces slide against each other, such as maybe a screwdriver trying to go into uh, a doorknob or a keyhole, and it scratches it when they're trying to break into somewhere, possibly. Could leave some scuff marks. And then number three, uh, cutting marks. Uh, produced along the edge of the surface of the cut. This could be like saws or things like that. Um, if they're trying to cut something or cut into something, um, we could have cut marks as well from the tool marks. Analyzing tool marks as evidence. Most tool marks are encountered in burglarly, uh, burglarly cases. Sorry, <laughs> I'm doing my best uh, with that word there. Sometimes I struggle with that. Uh, but they can also be found in other uh, crimes. Uh, I apologize. Uh, the best way to document tools and tool mark evidence is by photograph and to use, excuse me, a ruler for size reference. If possible, the whole object containing the tool marks should be submitted to a laboratory instead of just removing the area containing the mark. Uh, maybe like a doorknob again or something like that. We want to submit the entire doorknob. We don't just want to take the keyhole off the doorknob and submit it. We want to submit, or forensic scientists, I should say, um, or investigators want to submit the entire doorknob so it can, or so it can be uh, analyzed properly. Sometimes a cast can be made of the marks left behind by the tool. There can also be contamination, such as paint or building material, such maybe somebody uh, broke a window to break into something, and they might have, uh, when they use the tool, it scuffed the side of the house or the car, and it's on the window now or, some, or on the doorknob. Um, you know, that should also be used um, as evidence, um, and um, on the evidence that should be carefully wrapped and protected as well. <laughs> Excuse me. When examining the evidence, attempts should be made to, I'm sorry, should never be made, I apologize, to fit tools into questioned marks or to make test marks prior to laboratory uh, examination, I apologize. So again, we don't want to be poking and prodding around the doorknob with what we think might be the screwdriver that was used to break in, you know, because that could contaminate the evidence. So we want to make sure we're just simply photographing it and maybe making a cast of it and taking it to the laboratory. Now, a tool mark image database to provide, uh, I'm sorry, a tool mark image database to better analyze tools and tool marks using 3D characterization scans has also been developed by the Department of Energy's Ames, I believe I'm saying that uh, right, uh, laboratory at Iowa State University uh, to help identify tools as well. Impressions. Most crimes there are no witnesses or cameras to capture what happened. You probably understand that, right? Um, detectives must use evidence to figure out what occurred. There can be impressions as well um, left behind, um, made by shoes, tires, bare feet, teeth, or other objects that can serve as clues. So we're going to talk about a few of these here. So categories of impressions. Uh, number one, patent impressions. These are visible two-dimensional marks formed from soil, dust, blood, paint, ink, etc. Number two, Latin impressions. Um, evidence as hidden, um, sorry, evidence as hidden to the naked eye, but
but can be visualized through the use of dusting or electrostatic techniques. Often caused by oils or microscopic dirt particles depositing on a surface, similar to uh, possible when you talked about fingerprints to uh, oil on our fingerprints and our hands, um, kind of left behind by the oils there. Um, so it's similar to Latin fingerprints as well. And number three, plastic impressions. Evidence left as three-dimensional imprints on pliable materials, such as snow, mud, soil, or soap. Now, due to the substrate or the content kind of of these materials uh, that is soft, these prints can be lost, such as melted or blown away, and they should be photographed immediately. Okay, so that's the three categories of impressions. Using shoe impressions, um, using shoe impressions, I apologize. Tread patterns of shoe manufacturers are contained in databases. Oftentimes, it can be traced down to retailers or stores or companies which sell the shoe. Investigators can also use uh, shoe impressions in determining the possible height and weight of a person. Other information obtained from a shoe impression can be the size of the shoe or a person's foot, information on what type of shoe, such as a boot or a high heel or a sneaker, things like that, uh, the brand of the shoe, such as uh, background information about the person. Um, it could tell us maybe if the person has more money or less money, depending on the type of shoe that they're wearing. A wealthier person might wear a wealthier shoe, while a person who doesn't have a lot of money might wear a more, you know, a more um, common shoe that you might find out there um, um, in, a, in, a, in a particular store or something like that. And information about the walking pattern and condition of the shoe, such as whether the shoe was new or is it kind of worn, is it kind of older. Um, so again, can tell us whether people may have a certain amount of money and can afford different types of shoes or, um, you know, more common shoes that we see out there in general. Analyzing shoe impressions as evidence. When numerous prints are found at a scene, detectives can gain information about how many people were at the scene, the movement of individuals that were involved, and the entrance and exit of individuals at the scene. In terms of collecting shoe impression evidence, it's important to photograph the evidence as quickly as possible. Again, could maybe disappear due to the rain, the mud, the snow, or, you know, we don't want other people walking through, let's say the crime took place in a park, you know, other people walking around and trampling on the evidence, and then it's contaminated. Uh, multiple angles of the impression should also be taken, and a ruler should be used for reference. Now, the dusting of fingerprints is similar to the dusting of footprints. Sometimes people might not have shoes on, um, but they can leave behind uh, footprints that can also be dusted for and um, later analyzed as well. <laughs> Pardon me. Now, plastic impressions, which are 3D used with plaster of Paris, um, if you know what that is, kind of used in art sometimes, um, can be used to produce a cast of the shoe impression as well. Okay. So moving on to impressions of tires. Detectives and others can use tire evidence to link a suspect to a crime scene and to reconstruct the crime. Tire marks can also leave patent, lat uh, latent, or plastic markings as well. And again, I'm, I apologize if I'm pronouncing any of these words wrong. I'm doing my best with them. Uh, number one, patent impressions occur when a, when a car, I apologize, travels over a liquid such as paint, blood, or tar. Okay, so it leaves a trail kind of, you know, you can see like oil marks from the, and the oil kind of gets on the tires and we can see the tire marks. Um, latent tracks can be deposited from the oil used to soften tires, such as tires have oil and are made of rubber uh, typically, so we can also have tire marks from that. And then plastic impressions can be made when a vehicle drives on mud, sand, or snow, for example. Now, you know that tires have ridges and grooves on them, and ridges and grooves can help identify the wear patterns of tires as well and help identify the vehicle, such as whether it was, you know, 18-wheeler or was it, you know, a, you know, a regular vehicle that you see driving down the road? Was it a pickup truck? Um, was the car, is it a new, t is it a new t uh, truck, you know, um, or is it an older truck? We can tell that from the ridges and grooves as well. Uh, investigators can use the information of tire impressions to measure the whiffs along with the wheelbase lengths and turning diameter of a vehicle and check it against uh, the vehicle database, okay? To help, again, to help identify the potential uh, vehicle. Now, evidence of tire impressions. Clues about speed and direction of the vehicle can also be given to investigators by tire marks. This information can also help in accidents in determining who is at fault. 
Um, hopefully none of you have ever been in a car accident or a vehicle accident or ever experienced one. Um, but when there's multiple vehicles or when um, two people might be arguing about who's at fault, um, police can look at tire marks um, and determine, um, you know, who might be at fault. I've seen this in my personal life when I've seen, you know, police investigating tire marks with whether I knew the person involved in the vehicle accident or, you know, just driving down the road and they're taking photographs of the tire marks on the road and they can determine, you know, hey, this person's at fault or, you know, this person's not at fault. Um, they can use that information, okay? So it doesn't always have to be a very violent crime, although I'm not saying vehicle accidents aren't violent sometimes, but sometimes it can be something simple as a traffic, you know, a, a bumper to bumper or what they call a fender bender and they can try to figure out, hey, did this person stop in time at the red light or no, they didn't, you know, they can look at the tire marks to figure that out. Okay, so... Um, number one, skid marks. These form when a driver slams on the brakes suddenly, right? Um, can show the distance the vehicle traveled after the brakes were applied. They can also help calculate the speed of the vehicle, if they were speeding or not sometimes. Uh, number two, yaw marks. Skid marks that are sideways and that are produced when a vehicle turns faster than it can handle. Um, a lot of times, sometimes... Um, what I've seen or what I understand happens with 18 wheelers, right? If they try to take a turn too quickly, um, you can hear that smoking, uh, you can, excuse me, you can see that smoke or hear that squealing sound of them trying to control the truck or the, the 18 wheeler, and that's a yaw mark. Um, and then tire scrubs, evidence that shows the area of impact and damage on tires. So again, these could be like little bubbles on the tire, um, that show damage to the tire as well. All right, so understanding dental impressions. In mammals, teeth are one feature that lasts the longest. Now, teeth are made of uh, enamel and dentin. I'm sorry, enamel and dentin are what teeth consist of, which are made up of calcium and phosphorus. The hardest substance in the human body is enamel, which protects teeth from high temperatures and pressure and protects the living dentin layer underneath teeth. When babies are born, they do not have visible teeth, as you're probably aware. Uh, eventually, children have 20 primary teeth, while adults will have 32 permanent teeth. Now, since teeth develop at different times, a person's age can be roughly determined by the amount of teeth in their mouth. Analyzing dental impressions as evidence. Forensic scientists and investigators can use dental impressions for identifying body remains. Um, that's why sometimes when you go to the dentist, they take an x-ray of your mouth. That's to look for cavities and other problems, but also is recorded, um, I believe, and I could be mistaken, but in a database that um, helps, um, you know, that's able to track, you know, uh, just like fingerprints are, okay? Um, so hopefully nothing bad ever happens to anyone that you know or yourself, but it could identify body remains of someone when they look at those dental records sometimes. Um, also be used as evidence from a suspect, as in bite marks on a victim or at a crime scene. Now when collecting bite mark evidence, the bite marks should be photographed as soon as possible while the impressions are still visible and again should use a ruler, okay? So should use a ruler. Uh, the bite mark or bite mark should uh, also be swabbed for saliva, which may contain DNA. Sizes of teeth and the jaw affect, excuse me, sizes of teeth and the jaw affect the position and possible crowding of teeth, which makes each person's mouth unique. Just like our fingerprints, um, your teeth and your mouth are very unique, okay? Uh, therefore, bite marks are individualized and can have different factors. Fillings, crowns, or caps done by dental work. Chips or cracks caused by damage, looking at the coloration of the teeth, uh, the distances between teeth and the alignment of teeth, so maybe you might have some more gaps or maybe your teeth are tighter together, um, the alignment of your teeth, each tooth dim uh, dimension, I apologize, and the arc of the roof of the mouth. So probably some things you didn't think about before, but these can also help in identifying a suspect uh, with bite marks as well. All right, so our closure. How are tools and impressions used in forensics? Think about uh, tool marks. Think about uh, the different impressions we talked about um, or discussed uh, in the lesson here, um, especially with footprints and shoe prints, uh, tire marks and dental um, impressions and things like that, and that will help you answer your question. Um, please let me know of any questions or concerns, or you can also let uh, Mrs. Barbour or Mr. Hemi uh, know as well. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day or night, and uh, I hope to talk to you all soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.